Hello, everyone. Welcome to our presentation of Bedford Freeman and Worth's AP Updates for AP Language and AP Literature. My name is Lisa Erdely. I'm the host. If you have any questions at all, feel free to send them to me in the chat box within the network control section of the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, we have limited time for questions today, so we will be able to take a handful, we hope, after the presentation part is complete. Um, if there's questions that aren't answered, we will be happy to answer them at the very end um, through email um, or on our Classroom Compass site. So we'll send out a message that, that follows with um, the recording and um, any questions uh, that were asked that we weren't able to get to. Here we are at 6 o'clock on the East Coast here. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, as I mentioned slightly earlier, we will have some time for questions, but not a lot. We are, we are doing AP Language from 6 to 6.30 and AP Literature from 6.30 to 7. We'll be going over some of the course updates and changes and how BFW's materials will help you uh, meet those changes. We have four authors with us today. Um, we're going to begin with AP Language uh, with Robin Alfsis. She um, is the author on all of our AP books, uh, including the language of composition, literature and composition, and conversations in American literature. And currently, Robin is the English department chair at um, um, uh, the Lycée Francais in New York. Um, we also have with us Megan, I would say incorrectly, Megan, I apologize. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Viz. I know that's you, probably you want me to help out. I do my best. Thank you, this. But Megan's fine. <laughs> Thank you, this. I put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. Um, <laughs> Megan is our newest author. Um, she's on the language of composition and uh, helps with all of our teachers' materials. Uh, she's a national board certified teacher um, with over 10 years of experience in the classroom. And she's been recognized by NCTE um, and has been a past president um, and executive director of the Florida Council of Teachers of English. Um, and she's currently working at um, Colonel Zedak Magruder High School in Maryland. Um, and then following our language presentation by Robin and Megan, we will have Larry Scanlon and Renee Shea, um, who are also our authors on all three of the AP books. Um, Larry is retired from Brewster High School, where he taught lit and language, and he's currently teaching freshman composition at Iona College. Um, as many of you know, Larry has been a reader and table leader for the language exam, um, and has served on the test development committee as well. Um, and conducts many, many, many workshops in the summer um, as an, a college board consultant. And finally, Renee, um, one of the authors on all of our AP books as well, as well as our pre-AP materials. Um, Renee Shea is a, a former professor of English and Modern Languages at Bowie State and is uh, currently um, living in Ohio. And she has served as a reader, table leader, and question leader for both lit and language readings and as a college board advisor for AP language and conducts workshops all over the place so you, people often don't know where our Renee is located because she seems to pop up everywhere um, so we're delighted to have all four authors with us today my intro took a little bit longer than I would have liked so I'm going to quickly turn things over to Megan and Robin to get us started on the AP language portion Megan Robin thank you thank you Lisa. thanks Lisa so so um, go ahead Megan no, I was going to change the slide so that everyone can see our beautiful faces so that everyone knows that we are real people. As you can see, I'm a little shorter than everyone else. Um, <laughs> but I thought, <laughs> so I'm on the far right, and then Robin is appropriately next to me. So Robin, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that we, we're really here tonight to um, reassure you and, and tell you that um, uh, the college board's uh, new frameworks are interesting and challenging, but they don't really change things for us very much. The course goals remain the same. Um, uh, we want our students to develop critical literacy. Uh, we want to facilitate intellectually responsible civic engagement. Um, and um, the course will still be what it was. The course itself hasn't changed. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what it is and what it is not. Uh, we're talking about the framework here. Uh, the College Board is looking to help us kind of organize the skills and the concepts of the course. Uh, they've created a unit structure and it's a way to organize their resources and supports. Um, it's not a redesign. The course has not been redesigned. Uh, redesigns change the skills and the contents of a course. 
the skills and concepts here are unchanged. The framework is not a curriculum, it's not a lockstep curriculum, and one question you might ask is, what do I have to change? And the answer is nothing if I don't want to. Right, and I'm just going to jump in and add some actual language from the College Board framework introduction. Um, they specifically say that the objective of this publication is to provide teachers with clarity regarding the content and skills students should learn in order to qualify for credit, college credit and placement. The AP program recognizes that the real craft is in the skill with which teachers develop and deliver instruction. And I think that makes a lot of us feel better uh, knowing that this is not some sort of lockstep curriculum. We don't have to follow it in order that the college, that the college board and the AP program still trust teachers as professionals to make decisions for our students. Right. Uh, and, and for those of you who've used our books, you know that they are arranged by theme. And that's something that is very easily adaptable. And we're going to show you how to use the framework and use our book at the same time. So one of the important aspects to keep in mind with regard to the framework is that the framework is organized around what the College Board calls the big ideas. And those four are there on the screen, rhetorical situation, claims and evidence, reasoning, and organization, and style. So as Robin mentioned, the College Board says, you know, we trust you to organize your course the best way you see fit. And so you still have a lot of options, you know, unit-based, thematic, um, American literature, method of development, genre. But of course, we believe in our books that one of the best ways um, to organize the course is by theme. That being said, in our opening chapters, we really set the framework. And um, Robin, do you want to say a few words about those opening chapters? Um, yeah, I mean, that they, they reflect um, the essay types that are still required on the exam. Um, they introduce rhetoric, um, and of course, um, that is where the, the big skills, those big ideas, the rhetorical situation come in. We address claims and evidence in every chapter, really, but our chapter on argument um, is very much about claims and evidence. Um, and um, and certainly reasoning and organization um, is, again, addressed in every one of those chapters. And, of course, style is as well. Um, you know, we, we want, we expect our students to be able to analyze rhetorically. And, and we also, um, you know, the big ideas that we're teaching, we also want to see reflected in student writing. We want students to be able to write in a way that they're conscious of and speaking to a rhetorical situation. We want them desperately to make claims and then have evidence to support them. We want their, their writing to be reasoned, to be logical, to be organized, to be organized in a way that reflects and, and highlights their reasoning ability. And we want them to write with style. And I think those of us who teach AP Lang, the thing we love the best about it, or I certainly do, and every teacher I know, is how close the reading and writing are aligned in the course. We want our students to read very sensitively, but we want them to write very much the same way. So those things don't change. Absolutely. And so in the thematic chapters, we have questions that really promote that kind of close reading. But we also have suggestions for writing, which call upon students to do all of the things that they see, you know, quote, professional writers doing in their own writing. So we have those kinds of questions. We, we introduce the concepts in the opening chapters, and then all of the other texts and the questions that go along with them really just reinforce all of those skills. So these are some of the, the, oh, go ahead, Megan. Nope, you go, you're in. <laughs> uh, no, I was just going to say that, you know, these are some of the reasons that we are so committed to the thematic approach. Um, you know, the obvious things, that it builds analytical skills, sparks class discussion, 
engaging and inter interesting topics for writing, gives the students a reason to care about rhetoric. But I, I think one other thing that we find using a thematic approach, approach is we really begin to see the way the works that students read and that we teach are in conversation with each other. That they're not just sort of hanging out there by themselves, but that, you know, ideas grow one from the other. And very often um, they provide a, a, a lens or a mirror or a contrast to a piece that went before in the same chapter. And I think it helps students really appreciate and understand and work with the complexity of these college level texts. Yeah. I think what I like about the framework is that it, it is a guide. It's a very helpful guide and it's kind of like a reminder and in a way almost like a checklist to make sure that yes, we are teaching the skills on which students will be assessed at the end. But you know, if all we're doing is teaching skills, the course becomes very robotic, very stiff. The kids aren't making connections. Like we want this course to also pursue that goal of you know, creating engaged and informed citizens, and that's where the thematic approach really comes into play. So that yeah. as we're working with these skills, we're also thinking about the environment and our responsibility to the natural environment, or the extent to which schools um, serve the goals of true education, or the role of money. Like that's, to me, that's the, that's the heart of the course this and and what makes kids want to show up every single day and they also so we no, go ahead i was just going to say we also if we're talking about these very very important uh, issues and questions we of course want kids to be reading the highest quality writers and texts that they can we want them to read relevant recent but also classic and just beautifully written rhetorical pieces. And, and, I, and just to go back a little bit about the thematic chapter, I mean, for, you know, for some of our students, reading beautiful writing on the subject of sports or popular culture is a way for them to connect to the course also. And so it, it works. We have very high level readings in those chapters, but I think it helps the kids to feel that we are considering their interests as well. Absolutely. So I think um, that actually, and I'm glad Robin mentioned the pop culture and sports chapters because we're going to use the pop culture uh, chapter as an example of one of the resources that we've created to help teachers uh, kind of use this framework from College Board and also use the language of composition and really like very explicitly show how the two work together and, and complement one another. So what we've created is a pacing guide that brings the two, uh, the textbook and the framework together. So the College Board has provided in the framework information about the strand, uh, they identify the skill, um, you know, they consider, there's a column for considering the instructional purpose, and then also their pacing recommendations. So what we've added is the instructional, where you can find the instructional material you need in order to address the various skills captured on the, on the framework. So, so here's an example of what we've created. Of course, it will uh, probably be a little more pretty and with colorful than this, but we no, want it to be simple. So that this is just a tiny little snapshot of a part of it. Exactly. And we wanted to keep it simple so you could really see what we're talking about. So the, the parts in white are from, you know, taken from the framework. And then the yellow is what we've included to say, hey, if you are working on teaching skill 1A, identify and describe components of the rhetorical situation. Here's where you can look in the textbook to introduce those basic elements. And then here's where you can look in the book to practice analysis of the rhetorical situation and then to deepen the practice. And as you can see in, in the uh, box that goes along with deepen practice analysis, like we said before, we have questions throughout the book, throughout all of the thematic chapters, 
that really get to the skills the College Board is, you know, wants us to teach. And that's throughout any chapter. So that, of course, we can't, you, there's no way that anyone can teach this entire textbook, but that's a beautiful thing is there's so much choice that you can adapt to fit your students and, and your needs. Um, Robin, do you want to add anything before I flip to the next no, slide? I just wanted to say that, you know, we, we'll help you, uh, we're happy to help you pick the questions um, that, that we think will, you know, uh, help move your kids toward understanding these concepts. They will be, in the beginning, they'll be pretty explicit, uh, these opening chapters explicitly address rhetorical example. The early activities explicitly uh, test knowledge of a uh, rhetorical situation. The questions on the readings are a little less explicit. They're more analytical uh, and they're a little bit more um, complex. And so I think, you know, you can, you can find them in every single reading there are questions about rhetorical situation. But we're going to show you what we did as, as an example, too, so you can see more clearly what, what we were thinking about. Um, so the right. first skill so, that is identify and describe the components of the rhetorical situation, the exigence, audience, purpose, context, and message. And um, the instructional purpose is to introduce the basic elements of rhetorical situation. And if you turn to pages four through nine and read in chapter one, pages four through nine, the language of composition, there is explicit instruction on rhetorical situation. And the greatest practice ever, of course, is the Lou Gehrig speech, which is on pages five and six. Um, there's nothing quite like, and I, I work in a French school, my students don't even follow baseball, they don't even know what Lou Gehrig is, or even though we're in New York City, they barely recognize the Yankees, and yet this speech speaks to them. Um, because its components are so clear. Um, it, the the uh, rhetorical situation is so perfectly laid out, it's Lou Gehrig retiring from baseball, after a very, very successful career with the uh, New York Yankees. Um, he has a terrible disease. It's, um, he's in the field, surrounded by all the players. He's giving a speech to the people in the stands. It ran on the radio. He didn't particularly know that it would become worldwide famous. Uh, it's very intimate. And um, every element that, that the course is going to address is right there in that speech. It's a perfect way to introduce um, the rhetorical situation. There are follow-up activities for the Lou Gehrig speech on pages five, six, and eight. Good, good places to practice. And um, and then, let's say here you are. You want to introduce the first chapter to your students. Might be the popular culture chapter at, in the beginning of the year. Uh, it's a good place to start. Some some teachers I know like to start with the hardest. Some like to start with something a little bit more accessible. Um, but we, we're giving this example here of um, Bob Dylan's um, Nobel Prize banquet speech, which is on page 359. And um, we have a, a feature called Seeing Connections, and um, we thought a good place to start was with Patti Smith singing at the Nobel Prize Award ceremony, which she attended and Bob Dylan didn't. Um, and and an interesting discussion is what it means that Dylan didn't appear at the ceremony, but he wrote the obligatory address. Um, there are exploring the text questions, which we'll get to in the next slide. And, and we suggest, and Megan is very keen on this, that you then ask students to find their own, um, an example of their own speech, of, of a speech that also reflects the rhetorical situation. So if we go to the next slide, um, you'll see some examples of questions that are related to the rhetorical situation. Now, you'll notice they're not explicit. They don't say, what is the rhetorical situation? But in each case, a student, in order to answer them, or, or I, and I think these are great class discussion questions. I wouldn't necessarily give them for homework or give them for homework, but then discuss them. You know, how does Dylan establish credibility in this banquet speech? He's, someone else is delivering it. He's not in attendance. Um, how would you describe the tone of his speech? And, and is it different because he's not there? Um, does he honor the occasion by not showing up? Maybe he doesn't, but this, does the speech honor it? 
And um, you might, if your students are interested and in, in aware of that sort of thing, it's this kind of thing I would talk about with my students, in what ways is his voice distinctly American? And what effect might that have on the audience? Um, he alludes in the speech to the fact that the Nobel Prize was not awarded during World War II uh, when Sweden was maintaining its neutrality. And why might Dylan have mentioned that in his speech? That's a high, very high-level question. But again, it connects to the rhetorical situation of an American songwriter winning the Nobel Prize, very controversial, not showing up to give the speech, Patti Smith there singing instead, which if you've never listened to or watched is quite wonderful. She forgets the words um, to It's a Hard Rain, and she apologizes, and she says she's so nervous. It's just a beautiful moment. Um, but these are all connected to uh, the idea of rhetorical situation. Um, if you go in yeah, the next slide. Um, Robert, if I, Robert, oh, if before we switch to the slide, would you like to add? I just want to interject really quickly and just say, I think these questions are perfect in showing how they relate to the rhetorical situation, but as you said, um, in some ways explicitly and in other ways not. And so this is where the pacing um, guidelines that we're providing will will help where, you, you know, of course you can figure things out on your own, but if you're looking for just something quick where you're like, okay, but I want to make sure that I'm hitting these kinds of questions with this text. That's where the material that we're providing will help make that task a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Um, we also recommend then um, uh, moving to another piece in the pop culture called The Ballad of Balloon Boy, which is not particularly difficult reading, but the rhetorical situation is a little complicated. And it's a good way to, you know, deepen understanding of this idea of rhetorical situation. Megan, you want to talk about this because you made all these nice graphics. Right, yeah. Um, so, so what I was trying to get at here is, you know, we know that these units and the ideas, the skills within the units, they really interact with one another. It's hard to, it's hard to tease apart, you know, identifying components of the rhetorical situation from uh, explaining how an argument demonstrates understanding of an audience's beliefs. Like, of course, they're all related. So when you organize your course by theme, you know, if you're looking or and using the pop culture chapter, for example, what's nice is that you can you can make that pivot with a text that deals with the same issues, the same con um, concepts, and so the kids can think about the concept from one text to another while working on one skill and bridging to another skill so that it doesn't feel like, you know, kids are just jumping through hoops, that there is a conceptual flow to what they're thinking about, and yet they're also developing their skills and working through their skills. So that's also how we look at the thematic arrangement and the embedded guide that how it can help you move the kids forward within a thematic way. So um, so this is, you know, you can pivot from Dylan's speech to Ballad of Balloon Boy. Um, there are questions related to the rhetorical situation that accompany Ballad of Balloon Boy. Um, but then there are also other questions that you can use that work on another skill. So for example, question number nine um, asks about a statement. It says, what does he mean by this? defend, challenge, or qualify his statement, well, in the pacing guide um, for unit two, it says develop, oh, I'm uh, sorry, for unit one, develop a paragraph that includes a claim and evidence supporting the claim. Well, that's what the kids can do by answering this question, but they're still working with the text um, on which they've also been thinking about the rhetorical situation and fits in with pop culture and so forth. Um, and then same thing here, if you want to change it, you know, we have included, that's one of the biggest updates in the third edition, and I know Robin worked very hard on this, um, on these updates to include uh, more uh, visuals. And really, what were you saying, Robin? No, I'm just laughing. I mean, we love these visuals. We do. They're fun, and the kids love the visuals. And so, and, you know, we all, we all sometimes need a break from the written, Word and so the visuals are a great way 
um, to still address the skills. You know, the question we have about this, um, this still from the music video is that you know, students have to analyze this through the rhetorical triangle and thinking about the artist and the audience and what's the relationship. Um, so they're still practicing the skills, but with something that is um, a visual. And then again, like you can you can extend from there and say, okay, um, we want to make sure that we are explaining how an argument demonstrates understanding of an audience belief. So we've been looking at this picture that uh, features Beyonce, and so let's look at a couple of her speeches and address that. And those kinds of ideas we also include in the teacher's edition, really those extension activities that if you've got time, uh, you can work those in. And so that's an important part of, I think, what we include in our extra materials as well. Like you won't find some of this in the textbook, but we've included that um, on our Compass website or the or the teacher materials. But it all connects back to this framework and the skills. Before you move on, Megan, if it's okay, I'm just going to invite um, our attendees to submit their questions in the chat now so that when we do have a break um, at the very end, uh, they'll, they'll be queued up and I can read them off to you. So if you have questions, feel free to submit them to the organizers and panelists or just to me. Either one is fine. Cool. Um, and I think really, I mean, that's, that's all that we wanted to say about the framework and the embedded guide and how TLC works with the framework. Um, we know that we are also going to be facing, or um, the College Board is rolling out a new rubric for the free response questions. We don't have a lot of that information yet, but we are obviously, as we get it, we're creating materials and working on that. Um, we do know that the multiple choice has three uh, passages for text revision, and again, that's something else that we're working on making sure that we support teachers and have materials that um, that are supportive in with regard to the other changes yeah. that are happening. So, so that's all you. I had to say about this one. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, I will check so while you're while you're um, pulling that up. There are a couple of questions here. If people are asking, how are they to access? the materials that you're referencing. Um, and for everyone on the call, if you have not received or haven't had a chance to look at our AP Updates page yet, um, that's where you can find all of the materials that we've created for you. I am going to, I could say it out for you right now, but um, it's a little bit funky to spell out. So I'm going to put it right there in the chat um, and try to put it into the questions as well. So, and we'll put it up at the very end of the presentation as well. Yeah, and Lisa, it's our last slide. And it's also our last slide. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it, it, it will be right there. Mm -hmm. 